All right, our scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 18, verse 18, through chapter 19, verse 10. If you have one of these Bibles, it's on page 522. If you need one of these Bibles, um, I think they're on the table back there still, right? Yes? All right, Acts chapter 18, verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Shensharia because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all of the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, What baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. All right. Well, welcome to kind of the message part of our service today. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Romag. I'm the pastor here. So if you're online or first time guest, we're grateful to have you here. Uh, No matter why the Lord brought you here, and we hope that he'll speak to you today and hopefully encourage you. My message today is called Almost Christians, and so I want to talk about Amy and Mac. So these are two imaginary people, uh, but they kind of fit a profile. Right? Amy and Mac, they grew up going to church with their parents. Uh, they go to Easter and Christmas and once a month. So I don't know what you would call that, Christmas, Easter, C-E-M maybe, Christmas, Easter, and once a month. Uh, they go... Uh, because they want their two daughters to have good morals, right? To, to have Christian values. Uh, they think that those values, being a good person, will give them their greatest chance of success at life. Uh, and isn't that what God wants? God wants us to be good people. And so they send their daughter to vacation Bible school every summer. But that's about the extent of their uh, their. Uh, relationship with God. They've done a lot of things that outwardly appear pretty religious, right? They, they went up and their, their, uh, their niece was baptized. Amy's niece was baptized, uh, and she's the godmother, so she went up front and was kind of dedicated with her. Uh, and uh, when they go to church, well, they give money. They write checks. They give to charity. Uh, they donate to the food pantry. And when they go to the doctors, right, they mark off Christian on the form. <laughs> so that means they must be Christians, right? Uh, and yet, I think if they were to hear some of Jesus' words, they might question if they really are Christian or 
more, more realistically, they're actually almost Christian. So we find this in Matthew 7. Jesus says some pretty startling words that kind of wake us up, hopefully wake Amy and Mac up. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I don't know about you, but this is one of those passages whenever I hear it, I get a little fearful. <laughs> I get a little afraid. It causes me to pause and reassess my walk with the Lord, and I think that's what it's supposed to do. I'm hoping that if Amy and Mac or people like them heard this verse, they would also pause and reassess, ask the tough question, am I truly a follower of Jesus? Am I truly a Christian or am I more of a, a cultural Christian, right? I, I do this because this is what I've always done. I don't actually believe any of it, but it makes me feel good. Therefore, I go. Or conversely, if I don't go, I feel bad. Therefore, I go. Well, these ways of interacting with Jesus are really more almost Christianity than true Christianity. We don't want Jesus to turn to any one of us and say to us, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. And so as we look at our lives, we take time and we examine things. And as we look at this passage today and we look at the story of Paul as we go through the book of Acts, and we've been going through it for quite a while now, but we're kind of nearing the, the later chapters. He's wrapping up his second missionary journey today. Uh, if we look at Paul, he's pretty mindful of those people that are almost Christians. And that brings me to my first point, that like Paul, we should be mindful of almost Christians, of, of kind of that category of cultural Christians, uh, nominal Christianity. And so hopefully you're, you don't fit in that category. Hopefully I don't fit in that category. But there are lots of people that do fit in that category, and we should be mindful of them. Paul is been in Corinth for 18 months. He's about to make his way back to Jerusalem and then back up north to Antioch, so kind of finishing up his second missionary journey. But before he leaves for that long boat ride across the, the Mediterranean, he goes through a religious ceremony. Now, when you and I think of religious ceremonies, you probably think of like lighting a candle, <laughs> maybe uh, going to a quiet place and praying, Maybe opening up your Bible and reading Scripture, maybe journaling. I don't know what you think of when you think of religious, maybe like a, visiting a, a big, beautiful church with you know, stained glass windows. Paul cuts his hair. <laughs> I love that. Paul cuts his hair. Uh, it just shows like how different the world of ancient Israel is from us. He cuts his hair. He goes to the barber shop. 18.18 uh, 18 says this. After this, uh, Paul stayed many days and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. And at Sincrea, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. So Paul is under this thing called a Nazarite vow. So if you go back to Numbers 6, you can see that men and women in ancient Israel could set themselves apart for, to God for a period of time. During this time, they weren't supposed to drink alcohol, eat grapes, touch a dead body, or cut their hair because they were being culturally, uh, religiously uh, pure. Maybe you can remember a Bible character that is famous for never cutting his hair. <laughs> uh, he had big abs, big biceps, big abs. Samson, right? He's the guy that, that was so strong, he could take on thousands of Philistines and uh, and yet, if you go back and you read the story of Samson, we see him touching the carcass of a lion and, uh, you know, uh, drinking uh, wine and, and things like that and, and not being obedient to this. And eventually he cuts his hair, right? And, and, uh, and then he loses his strength. His, his hair is cut and he loses his strength. Uh, and so Paul here is doing something that's very interesting because he doesn't believe you have to fulfill these Old Testament vows to be saved or to, to know Jesus. He's actually going out of his way to perform a, 
a, a cultural, symbolic thing that would have mattered to the Jewish people. Uh, and then he's, he, you know, he's being mindful of it, right? He's, he's going out of his way to be mindful of the Jews in Jerusalem and scattered throughout Israel who really would have cared about these things. Because he's been traveling among the Gentiles and people would have looked at him as perhaps unclean, as someone who really doesn't care about Jewish beliefs. And well, Paul, Paul is showing that he does care about the Jewish laws and beliefs. He doesn't believe that you need to practice them in order to be saved, but he believes that it's important to kind of take a humble approach and, and show that some of these things matter to the people of Israel. I was thinking uh, back to the time I shaved my head. Uh, so my sister-in-law had uh, ALL as a child, so that's acute lymphatic le le leukemia. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, leukemia. Uh, and so she would participate in this thing called St. Baldrick's Day. Have any of you heard of St. Baldrick's Day? All right, so St. Baldrick's Day is where you say, hey, I'm going to shave my head. How much money will you give me <laughs> for this good and worthy cause of, uh, of addressing childhood cancer? And then once you've done all your fundraising, you get together and they all have all these barbers come and they all shave your heads all at once. And it's, uh, it's kind of a fun moment. It's like the worst haircut I ever had. Uh, <laughs> uh, and my sister-in-law still does it uh, every couple of years. Uh, so I think she did it last year or the year before. So her hair is pretty uh, short. Uh, uh, now, when I did it, uh, I can't say that I was like, oh, I, I want this haircut. It was more of doing it to kind of be a part of uh, my sister-in-law's thing that she cared about, right? So I was, I was shaving my head because it meant a lot to her, and also because I knew it was a good thing to like, raise some funds for cancer. Uh, and so I, I think that's sort of what Paul is doing, right? He's, he knows that this doesn't do anything for him really spiritually, but he knows that it matters to those other people, to his other Jews. And so uh, he shaves his head. And that, I think Paul famously said this in 1 Corinthians. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some, right? Now, Paul does not mean that he's going to do anything that's like contrary to the gospel or to faith in Christ Jesus or anything that would be disobedient to Jesus or God's word. But outside of disobeying God... He's willing to, to make a change, including shaving his head, because he's being mindful of the almost Christians around him. Now, a month or two ago, I preached a sermon kind of where I talked about gatekeeping, right? That sometimes as Christians, we can erect gates of things that really don't matter to Christianity, but we expect non-Christians to kind of navigate their way through them in order to become part of our it crowd, right? And I mentioned things like politics, where we were like, oh, you have to agree with me politically before we can uh, kind of be a part of the same church family, and how we as Christians don't want to do that. Maybe, maybe with even like our worship style, right? You have to worship like I worship. You have to sing the same songs that I sing, or other things like that. But as we look at this passage, it's like, that's kind of like the negative example. I think this is like the positive example, right? That Paul is not just like not doing something so that others will come to Christ. He's actively doing something to help other people come to Christ, right? He's doing something that uh, perhaps makes him uncomfortable or, or something that he wouldn't normally do to help the Jews come to faith around him. And so I want us to think about our own lives for a moment, right? The things that we do and the things that maybe our non-Christian neighbors or coworkers or friends do, that like we wouldn't normally participate in. There's nothing wrong with them, right? But uh, just for whatever reason, my interests don't align with that. Or, or even maybe culturally, I'm not from like this New England region, so I don't, I don't do that sort of thing. Uh, but they do it, and you're like, well, maybe we can think about how, how can we become more engaged in those things in order to share the love of Christ, right? So like, for me, I'm not a big sports fan, right? But I could go and I could watch sports. I could watch football. And you're like, oh, wow, really falling on your sword there, Jonathan. Like, you know, but that, that's for me, right? Maybe it's like, maybe one of your coworkers really loves like Oprah. And you're like, I don't really like Oprah, but I'll watch an episode of Oprah. Uh, I'll learn about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle so that I can talk with you about Oprah and what's going on in their life so that I can somehow share the love of Christ with you. 
right? Or maybe there's, uh, you know, a, a documentary on Netflix that everyone is watching at work, but you haven't seen it. Well, maybe you go and you watch that documentary so that you can then figure out ways to connect it with Christ and, and bring in a Christian perspective. You know, I remember when we used to go to work before COVID, right? Sometimes your coworkers might go get drinks after work or go eat dinner. And maybe you'd say, well, I got to get home to be with the family. Well, maybe this is an opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my Nazarite vow. I'm going to cut my hair. I'm going to go and I'm going to spend time with them. I just had like a year and a half of not spending time with them. And Paul actually would take, uh, so when they, when they finished their Nazarite vow, they would take uh, the hair. So they'd cut the hair, they'd take it, and they'd burn it in the, at the temple in Jerusalem uh, as an offering. And I think there's something in that. I think when you and I go out of our way to love people and kind of build bridges with people that that don't know Christ, I think God does receive that as like a little offering. It's a little offering, a little sacred moment of worship to God. You know, burn your hair. <laughs> maybe you actually, maybe like a coworker or friend has cancer, and so you cut your hair too, right? Just to, just to kind of go out of your way to show them love. I don't know, maybe there's something that's coming to your mind, maybe not. Maybe you can pray about it. Say, Lord, how do you want me to kind of take that extra step to show Christ's love to those around me, to be mindful of them? So like Paul, we should be mindful of almost Christians. And now, since we're in Acts, it's a time for the map. We watch, no, we don't watch. Well, we sort of watch. We, we talk about Dora a lot in the, the realm of gospel, right? And the, the map, the map. Where's the map, the map? Uh, I don't really know the song, but uh, if there's like a place you want to go, ask the map. Uh, so we're in the book of Acts, right? And so this is kind of the journey that Paul is taking, right? He's right in Corinth. He goes down to Centria, he cuts his hair. He sails to Ephesus, he goes down to Caesarea, he goes down to Jerusalem, he goes back to Antioch. And then he starts his third missionary journey back into Galatia and Asia, so this is kind of the, the journey that Paul is on. It helps to really kind of look and see, like, this is rooted in an actual place and an actual time. Uh, and as we look at this next part, we're going to see that like, Paul has been mindful of the almost Christians, but we're going to meet this other character that he just kind of gets sandwiched in here. His name's Apollos. And Apollos uh, tells us also about what it means to be an almost Christian, uh, because it, it's possible to know about Christ and be almost right. So as we look at Apollos, we see like he knows a lot about Jesus, but he doesn't quite have the full story. So Acts 18, 24 through 26 says this. It says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And then he goes on and he preaches the gospel powerfully. So there's not a whole lot we know about Apollos. We know that he's kind of like a, he's someone that you would want to, I listen to someone uh, preach on this, like someone who would, you would want to pastor your church. <laughs> because they'd be like this amazing preacher. Right, they would be able to. Uh, you'd, you'd listen to their podcast because they would have uh, just amazing sermons. They would talk about God. You would be moved. But then there'd be like something that's like just a little bit missing because he knew about the Messiah. It says that he had been uh, instructed in the way of the Lord, uh, talking about Jesus, and uh, he knew only the baptism of John. Right, so he knew about John the Baptist and John's ministry. Uh, who was pointing forward to the Messiah, right? So John the Baptist came before Jesus. He said things like, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, talking about Jesus. And he preached a baptism of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Apollos was close. He was near, but he didn't quite have the full story. So maybe he didn't know about like the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe he didn't know how Jesus was going to save. Maybe he knew that like Jesus was a Messiah type figure, but 
You know, maybe it was more of a, a, a political figure. We're not exactly sure where Paulus lined up, but we do know that he was almost there. <laughs> he was almost there, almost right. And he needed to be corrected. I, uh, I got this book this week called Unsaved, the Unsaved Christian, right? Reaching Cultural Christians, uh, Christianity uh, with the Gospel. Uh, and our Christians with the gospel. I've read a, a couple chapters, and I, and I did kind of think that there was one chapter that was especially appropriate to our context in New England, uh, and that's the chapter on, uh, called Generational Catholics. Generational Catholics. And many of us have family members or come out of Catholicism. Now, this guy's pretty tough on Catholicism and says, you know, pretty much none of them are Christians. I don't agree with that. Uh, but I do think he makes some good points, because you can become a cultural Catholic, right, that you, know, you go through confirmation, you go through the kind of the, the, the Christian ed aspect, you, you, get, you get, got baptized when you were a baby, uh, but really there's no true experience of God's grace. There's no true knowledge of who Jesus is, like Jesus is on a little cross on the wall, but do you know that that, that person died for you? Right, that, that person on that cross didn't stay on that cross, but he actually died for you to pay for your sins and then rose again from the grave. And sometimes that knowledge is missing uh, in Catholicism. And so I think this is a challenge that if you are a Catholic or you know someone who is, to really think, like, do I, do I genuinely have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Notice I'm not calling you to come out of Catholicism. I'm calling you to Jesus, to come and meet him, to, to, to receive forgiveness of sins and, and to take the, the burden of proof off of yourself, that I have to somehow prove that I'm good enough to God, that I have to go through religious motions, whatever ever they may be, whether it's just doing good deeds or if it's going through some sort of uh, rituals. I don't have to do those things to be saved. I don't have to shave my head. Salvation is through Christ Jesus and him alone. Thankfully, the story doesn't end here for Apollos. Right? Apollos has two people that are brave enough to say, hey, you're close. You're close. But you're not quite there. Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife team. They tell Apollos the truth. I don't want to miss it, but Priscilla is a woman here. and She evangelizes Apollo. She teaches Apollos the truth. And there's fruit there. He comes to a full understanding of the gospel. That's important. And so we see there's something amazing happening here that you know, God takes Apollos and uses a man and a woman to transform uh, Apollos so that he does have it right. So like Apollos, it's possible to know about Christ and, and, and yet be almost right. And like the 12, it's possible to almost have the Holy Spirit but not actually be transformed by him. So Paul continues now on his third missionary journey. Uh, he returns to Ephesus in the middle of Asia. Uh, and uh, this is what happens. And, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul pastored the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. John must have had an amazing ministry if so many people knew about him and had such a wide influence. He was preparing the way, though. He wasn't the end goal. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance... Right? Like, understand your own sin, understand your own guilt, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, some churches and uh, think that you have to kind of, you, you believe, and then God, like, people lay their hands on you, and you receive the ability to speak in tongues and are kind of anointed in the Holy Spirit and kind of like a second baptism. We don't believe that here. Uh, but we do believe that you do need, like, the Holy Spirit can come in special ways. 
right? And the Holy Spirit can anoint you. It's just not like, oh, there's this first class of Christian that hasn't spoken in tongues, and then there is this other class of Christians that has spoken in tongues. And so if you go back to Acts 8, we see there's no speaking of tongues when the Holy Spirit comes. And so if we look at the book of Acts, we kind of see, like, I love that Jesus describes the Holy Spirit this way in, in, in John chapter 3. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it come from, comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is a mystery. But you do need the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. And I believe that if you believe in Christ, that the Holy Spirit gives you that. There was this uh, famous minister, George Whitfield. So I read his biography, and uh, he was like, the, uh, back in the 1800s, like with the, the uh, it was, he was famous, and then it was like King George II. So like, he was like the second most famous person in the world. Uh, and he actually preached on the Boston Common to 20,000 people. Uh, and it was, it was said at that time that when he was doing his ministry in America, eight out of every 10 people had heard him preach in the, in the American colonies. So eight of every 10 uh, people. He's like an Apollos, right? He's just a very powerful preacher. But his message was this, are you born again? Have you been transformed by the Holy Spirit? Has God actually got a hold of your heart? Or are you just going through the religious motions? Because going through the religious motions is an absolute waste of time. But when the Holy Spirit gets your hold of your heart and transforms you and begins to purify you, that's where we know that like, we've experienced God, that we're encountering God. He described it as like a, 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 piece of gold, a piece of ore, right? You find this ore, you melt it down, and that's how you get gold. You refine it, and you transform it. And you see, like, that's what God does with us. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he takes us from this like lumpy, uh, hard rock and he refines us, and he polishes us, and he purifies us into a piece of gold. Or like a, a, a broken piece of glass, right, that's dirty. And you take it, and you wash it off, and you scrub it off, and it's like this beautiful, like, green glass that you can see through. That's what God does for us. That's what God does with us through the Holy Spirit. He, he transforms us in our lives to look a little bit more like Jesus. He takes us through good times and hard times, forming us transforming us. So here's the hard truth. You can believe all the right things and not know Jesus. You know, it says in James, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> demons have good theology. In fact, demons have better theology than us because they know. <laughs> they can see with their eyes. Theology doesn't save you. It's a right relationship that comes from knowing who God is, right? It's not the theology itself. It's like what the theology tells you. The theology wants to introduce you to God himself. And just in case you hear that theology doesn't matter, it does matter. We do need to understand beliefs, right? But knowledge puffs up. And if we somehow kind of are just accumulating theologies and knowledges so that like we have the right the right set of beliefs, and those people have the wrong set of beliefs, and that house somehow makes me feel good and them look bad, then we've completely missed the story. So theology is about knowing God. It's about being in relationship with Him. It's about being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And so, as you look at yourself, how can you know? How can I know if I, if I am? Like, like, I don't want to be an almost Christian. <laughs> uh, we actually were talking about this a little bit Yesterday at our, uh, our men's kind of campfire in the morning, we actually I brought up this verse. Where it says, a, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So you can think of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience. Is God producing these fruits in you or not? Is God uh, uh, producing the, the fruit of obedience, of, of following Jesus, of loving Jesus, of loving God and loving others? Yes or no? It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, not at all. But do you see like marginal signs of, of like God transforming? And maybe it's not even you. <laughs> maybe you should ask the person sitting next to you, do you see God's work in my life? 
Do you see God transforming me? And this is why it's, part, it's so important to be a part of a church family, right? Where, where you're, you're a part of a group of people that can come around you and say, it looks like God's working in your life. And we want to be a part of that. And uh, I think it was the Bradshaws who are doing a study with Scott Dutani's book, right? Where the illustration was, focus less on the fruit and focus more on the roots, right? Dig deep into your relationship with God instead of trying to produce for God. God, I'm just going to grow some fruit. <laughs> Pretty hard to do. <laughs> instead, focus on the roots. Dig deep into your relationship with God and trust that he's going to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience. And so, like Paul, right, we should be mindful of almost Christians. Like Apollos, it's possible to know about Christ and be almost right. Like the Twelve, it's possible to almost have the Holy Spirit, but not actually be transformed by Him. So this kind of leads me to my big idea that the Holy Spirit can transform almost, believe, almost Christians into genuine believers. And that's what we need, right? We need God to come and to work in our lives. And so often he, he likes to use Priscilla's and Aquila's to do that. And so at first you need to reassess, do I, am I an almost Christian? Do I really know God? Yes or no? And maybe you can ask a Priscilla or Aquila, your youth leader, you know, you're, you're an elder, a deacon, just someone that you know in the church that cares about you. Hey, you know, help me to, 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 to follow Christ. How am I doing? And then just pray. Ask God, say, Lord, would you come and would you transform me from the inside out? <clears throat> and maybe God is calling you to be a, a Priscilla or Aquila to say, hey, I've noticed some things that you understand, but do you really know Christ? This is what the deeper message is about. Let me 